This is the Steve Shriver Podcast, the show where entrepreneur, adventurer, and community activist Steve Shriver shares what he's learned on his journey so you can make it in business and make it good. The big topic for this episode, don't start a business, start a movement. I think it's just, it's all about um, just a greater, deeper sense of connection with your customers and where, you know, instead of just, instead of just worrying about the, sh- the shareholders of the business, you look at all the stakeholders involved. And this is, it's activism. We'll be right back. The Steve Schreiber Show is brought to you by Ecolips, the original organic lip balm. Use the promo code PODCAST20 for 20% off your first order on Ecolips.com. Ecolips, all natural organic lip balm. Deeply connected with nature, applying beneficial organic ingredients to better people's lives. A proud certified B Corp founded in 2003. Ecolips, spread the good. And spread the promo code PODCAST20 into that promo code box. It's good for 20% off your first order on Ecolips.com. Cool. Welcome to the Steve Shriver Show, Steve Shriver Podcast. That's what this is. We are going to rock on uh, entrepreneurship. This is what we do. This is what I am. And I am here to spread the gospel of entrepreneurship with you. Uh, with me is producer Joe Coffey, good friend of mine and uh, amazing knowledge base. And he can always kind of bring me back to the ground, uh, back down uh, where I need to be sometimes. So, right on. Yeah, so a uh, little bit about me real quick. I'm Steve Shriver. I, uh, I am a serial entrepreneur. I have been a, an entrepreneur since I was born. Um, I currently own five businesses in five different industries. Uh, Ecolips is an organic lip balm business that's sold in 12,000 retail stores across the country. We've got a small cafe called Bruhemia in Cedar Rapids. Soco Outfitters, we are a Patagonia shop in Cedar Rapids and uh, outdoor camping adventure store and uh, the Olympic South Side Theater, which is a 10,000 square foot event venue. And none of them have anything to do with each other, different partners, different landscapes and everything. And it's been such a great learning experience to do all that stuff. Then I've, I'm part of a, uh, a startup uh, of an electrical product that we're bringing to market here too. And, uh, and maybe tomorrow I'll be a part of something else that we'll talk about. You know, I just love that whole thing. I think the businesses that I have started have done over a billion dollars in retail sales. That's crazy. Right. So that's, Congrats. I guess. Right. I mean, that, Thanks, that's man. what it's all about. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, started with the first sale and, and I'm self-made, you know, like, uh, I didn't have any, uh, actually I was on, you know, uh, I was on welfare at one point in my life. And, uh, and now, uh, to be, you know, to be considered successful and to be able to share that with, with you and have these conversations with you is beautiful. So, Awesome. Sh- sh- awesome. Yeah. Sh- sharing the knowledge. That's, yeah. That's, that's what, what it's all about. about. That's what right it's on. all about. So about this sharing the knowledge thing um, uh, and keeping it fresh, uh, I, I would like to, this is, we're going to try this out. If okay. This is, uh, we, we have no, we don't know what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, <laughs> I have put a bunch of topics in a hat and Joe's got a nice very nice fedora. It's, Thank you. Joe has multiple fedoras. If you can, you know. <laughs> when you lose your hair, you start wearing fedoras. It's a rule. It's <laughs> so here we go, man. We're going to find out what our topic will be today. And uh, this is what's going to keep it, keep it kind of fresh here. So, mm. oh, don't start a business, start a movement. Okay. That seems like fun. That's, that's up your alley. That is up my alley. Yeah. 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 So let's, uh, let's talk about not starting a business and starting a movement. Okay. So a business could be a Kool-Aid stand, right? Uh, yeah. Lemonade stand selling widgets or whatever. You're saying it's not about the widgets. Yeah, no. Right. So one thing, it's interesting, like even Ecolips, uh, back in 2003, when we started Ecolips, it wasn't about, it wasn't about the lip balm. It was about the organic industry. Um, and it was that organics were not, they weren't popular. They weren't in every grocery store. They what, weren't. Uh, what year was this? This was 2003. Okay. So this was, you know, kind of before organic was cool. It was before most companies were green. And, and so we took an opportunity to identify uh, that space and say, you know what, we want, not only do we want to, 
we want to be the first organic lip balm on the market, but we also want to, uh, we want to grow the organic industry. And so we looked at our product, uh, as a gateway organic product. We wanted, we wanted to create an accessible product to as many people as possible, um, at a reasonable price. And if they have a good experience with our organic lip balm, we thought it could fuel the entire industry. And guess what? It worked. Uh, we can't take credit for, you know, the entire industry, but through just this, you know, like heavy sampling and heavy distribution, uh, we, we went from, you know, our first sale, our first store into over 12,000 retail stores. And meanwhile, watched, watched the industry go from segregated organics into integrated organics. In, th- in, in every, now every store in the country, including your convenience stores have organic products. And, so, and for context, um, that's a crowded category in the natural products industry right now. Oh yeah. Uh, I, I've been to the natural products expo several times. Uh, yeah. and it, it blew my mind. It like bars and lip balm. Right. There are a thousand <laughs> companies and booths when you go to that big show mm-hmm. and you go to any whole foods across the country, they're going to have a, a different little selection of, 20 different lip balms, yep. but you guys were the first. Yeah. Yeah. And you, uh, first organic. First organic. Right. Yeah. And so, you, you know, yes. Um, the other interesting thing about lip balm is like anybody can make it, man. It's, it's like it's beeswax and oil and, you know, or a vegan wax and oil and, and put some flavor in it and you're good. Um, and so to really, you know, to have something that's that different and that people, you know, that you can, uh, you know, uh, build a customer base around. Um, for a couple dollars a piece is pretty phenomenal. And, the, and now that we're, we've got the distribution we have, uh, it's pretty big. So we, we were passionate about organic and wanted to, uh, and wanted to make a positive change in our, in our own lives and in the lives of others in the world we live in. And we launched an, a, a, this little tiny product. And we, now we, you know, we've got over a hundred employees and we continually innovate and impact and use certified organic fair trade. Now this is starting to sound like an advertisement. So I don't want to, I, I, I don't want to go there. So I'm going to change it to another business. Okay. Um, uh, Soko Outfitters. Yep. We live in a town, um, of, uh, you know, roughly, let's say 250,000 people, uh, all Metro in and the, we did not have an outdoor camping store that was independently owned. Every yeah. freaking town that you go to that is halfway cool has that little mountain shop or outdoor store or fishing store, or camping store. And just, you know, been here 20 years now. And I'm like, man, year after year, it's like, when is somebody going to do that? When is somebody going to do that? And, and the, you know, finally just said, you know what, this town needs this town needs a, an outdoor store. And so um, now what, what that means is like, yes, we have, to, we have to bring in the right brands that people are going to hopefully buy from a brick and mortar shop. But what the greater sense of it is, is this movement is that we, we have now helped cultivate more of an outdoor community and outdoor culture. We've, we've taken people hiking in the Grand Canyon and we've taken people snowshoeing in Beverly park and everywhere in between. And so building community, building this movement, it makes, it's making our city better. It's making our people, you know, us healthier. And, uh, and, uh, yeah, we're filling a a need in the community. So when it comes to marketing, I, I always believe that good marketing, good businesses, good, everything solves problems, answers questions. All right. So if I need a new jacket, Mm -hmm. I'll go to, REI online or Von mm-hmm. Mar and all Patagonia, North Face. There are certain brands that in that outdoor space, it's quality, it's it's good manufacturing practices. For you to create SoCo in a way, it answers those questions, solves those problems. But, you know, connect that dot. You're talking about like trips and local snowshoe hiking. I mean, it, it's more than just here's your jacket, here's a good price. It's, right. it's more than that. Right. So, you know, uh, what, one of the amazing things about the outdoor industry is that it it's like the people that are attracted to the outdoor industry are doing, it's all about great experiences, about sharing those experiences and that, that community. Lifestyle. So, yeah, it's a lifestyle. Absolutely. And um, so 
So having a place rather than, you know, this very sterile online purchase of this very high tech piece of gear, uh, having a place where you can go touch it, feel it, um, embrace it, wear it, try it on, talk to a professional about it. It just doesn't, it's, it's not common practice anymore. Mm -hmm. So in that regard, I think, you know, uh, brick and mortar has its place. Um, it, it, not as much as it used to, but I, I believe that brick and mortar will always, uh, be present. Um, just in, but you have to be relevant. So, so we're relevant in that we are carrying stuff that you would have previously ordered online. And instead of that, we're bringing over a million dollars in sales into this little brick and mortar store every year and, and serving our community. Meanwhile, educating them on what more they can do around town, um, educating them more on, uh, you know, international trips and we're, then we're, you know, bringing in speakers and all this stuff. So, uh, yeah, so it's a movement. We've created an outdoor movement in Cedar Rapids. How long has the business been up and running and are you in the black yet? Yeah, uh, it's three years and we broke even our first year. That's crazy. Yep. Yep. I mean, that is as new businesses go, especially retail. That's yep. Yep. So, uh, and now granted, we're none of us are going to retire off this thing. Um, I pretty sure to date, uh, we haven't been paid a penny. Yeah. So that's Uh going to be maybe a common theme about it. (laughs) So, I mean, you got to, at some point you, when you're building a, you know, building a movement is, is, does that like with Ecolifts, we had to say, all right, you know, we, we now need to focus on the bottom line because we got bills to pay and we got to get some compensation. Uh, but being committed in a way that, um, you know, beyond the dollars, this is, you know, doing this because I'm passionate about it and, and, and believe, and my partners and I believe that the community needs it. What is it about, uh, you know, connect these dots for me, Ecolips and SoCo, what is it about a movement that kind of makes a difference? Well, you know, it's like a way that you can connect with the customer in a deeper level. And, and it's not that we're doing, we didn't start a movement so that we could just generate more sales. We started yeah. a movement because it feels like the right thing to do. But I think, and I, I think it's just, it's all about um, just a greater, deeper sense of connection with your customers and where, you know, instead of just, instead of just worrying about the, sh- the shareholders of the business, you look at all the stakeholders involved. And this is, it's activism, you know, in a, in its, in its various forms. So, I mean, you have, we all have choices with our businesses to, to make positive change or to, to do do whatever we want with them. I have chosen to use every single one of the businesses that I've been involved with to do something good. And whether it's giving money back or giving, you know, doing it for the community, um, but, and that's, that's the, the B Corp mentality is this triple bottom line people, planet, and profit. And uh, Ecolips is a certified B Corp. Um, we, the B is for benefit, but the other, the other three businesses that are active uh, in my life right now are not B Corps, but we still think about them in the same way, you know, okay. above average wages. Uh, you know, we're talking, you know, above average benefits um, and just making sure that we take everybody into account that, that we, we touch. In so, the if, if somebody's selling widgets or, or, or lemonade, right. Mm-hmm. Um, I think a lot of entrepreneurs are immediately thinking about profitability and mm-hmm. what can I do mm-hmm. and how do we scale at the same time to bring in profit. And so I'm hearing you say kind of based off this B Corp thing, uh, it's about more than just profit. And it sounds like a commitment and uh, some might call it a gamble, right? Like you're, you're hanging your hat on this lifestyle around the business, but you're hoping that that will lift it up and bring in customers who want more than just widgets. Right. So <laughs> I think, okay, I gotta, I gotta, I'm going to, I'm going to drop this hammer. <laughs> <laughs> okay. This is the, the, this is, we're going to drop the, the hammer. hammer, the hammer of truth here. So <laughs> made with a uh, derecho wood, the derecho. Yes, my dad made wow. that. Yeah. That was just amazing. So, so here we go. Make no mistake, <laughs> Joe. <laughs> Make no mistake that the uh, that that profitability is key, and that's part of the triple bottom line. It's people, planet, and profit. Like you have got to have profitability, but you can't profit from zero sales. So, like first things first, 
get the top line up there and you you will 100% work harder at a business that you are more passionate about. And so in, in what, what is driving your passion? Well, hopefully, you know, it's not, it's not just the profit that's going to drive your passion. Hopefully you're doing something that is actually fulfilling to you because it's 100% possible to do that. Um, it makes so much sense when you right. say that. It's like, how could somebody not be focused in that direction as they start a business? Right. It should be something you're profitable or you're, you're passionate about. So, so drive, do everything you possibly can to get the top line going and get some momentum going, get your sales and your revenue figured out so that you have a pool of profit to work with. Uh, but it's top line first, bottom line second. If you're too worried about profit in the beginning, you you will suffocate the business. Uh, I, you it, you know it, it, it's a it's an ebb and flow, but you can easily you know if you you know no you know it's like people that cut back marketing because their business is down when you should be spending more on marketing when your business is down. It's similar. Yeah. You 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 have to you need the top line to have the bottom line, and you need to artfully fuel the top line with the profits. But uh, it's it's a crazy game and a crazy balance. So what about people listening to this podcast who are thinking, okay, I, I get it like a lip balm. Uh, it goes in my body. Mysteriously, three hours later, it's gone. So I'm ingesting it. So sure, organic, good ingredients right. make right. sense. Uh, Soco, outdoor activities, hiking, biking, lifestyle, mountain climbing. Um, I get it. That one's easy, lifestyle. But back to lemonade and widgets. What if somebody listening to this is like, mm-hmm. What is my thing? Like, how do mm-hmm. I, wh- wh- what is the equivalent for me? I'm just selling widgets. Like, how can people care that much? What is the, that X factor? What's, what's your advice on finding that? You know, I mean, I, I'm probably the, not the right person to ask that question to because I'm not going to waste my time doing something that is not fulfilling to me. So if, but let's say, all right, I get handed uh uh, gosh, you know, if I, if I, if I, uh, if all of a sudden I'm selling tires, I'm trying to think of something I'm not passionate about. Yeah. At yeah. All, okay. Yeah. But people need, <laughs> right. People need tires yeah. and I'm okay. I'm in, I'm in, I, all of a sudden I, I, I'm given a tire business and, and I have to run this thing, uh, because I now own it. So, and there's bills to pay. Yeah. How do I make, how do I create passion around that? I think it's a matter of, for one, understanding that the, my product, uh, it actually saves lives. So like having tires mm-hmm. that are properly, you know, that mm-hmm. are, you know, properly maintained and, you know, they're, they're having the right tires in your car can save your life at certain times. So I can feel better about that. Um, I would, I would get involved with, I've always worked with nonprofit groups and get involved with some entities outside third parties that I can help through my business. And by, marketing that properly and doing it right. Um, it's a win-win for both parties. Our customers can feel good about buying our tires because they're, they know that a dollar for, or, you know, that a dollar from every tire is going to go to a, a car for a, a person in need or something like that, you know, create a, a like-minded cause that your customers can get behind. Do you ever have investors or a board or some, some body within the business uh, who you really have to sell that to and might, push oh, back yeah. against it. Oh yeah. All the time. And, and those are the kind of things it's really hard to, uh, to, to prove an ROI on that kind of activity. And that's where it's kind of like, you know, um, you, you just, you, you, part of it is that taking that, that risk of doing, doing the right thing and hoping it returns. I think it's like this, uh, when we, when, and Yvonne Chouinard said it a uh, high level. He's the founder of Patagonia. He said it, he was like, look, every time we, we gave more away, our sales increased every time we gave more away. And then even more anecdotally, like Ecolips, when we, when we got our fair trade designation uh, and we added that third party seal of fair trade to our packaging, our sales went up 15%. And, and fair trade is the art of, I mean, we're paying, not the art, fair trade is, is uh, we're paying a premium uh, to our, our growers, you know, in the supply chain uh, for their goods to make sure that nobody's getting taken advantage of. 15% increase fair trade. Then we go non-GMO verified, 15% increase. Uh, and these are things that are benefiting the environment and making our customers feel good. And now they're benefiting my, co- you know, our company. 
So you've gone through several of these uh, seals, yep. so to speak, and they're trouble. Mm. It's it's mm-hmm. like process verification, uh, like vendor, you know, verifying all kinds of oh, things. Yeah. Uh, every time you get a new seal for one of your businesses, mm-hmm. I'm hearing you say that it it res- it results in in more profit. Uh, so there's this investment, right, and mm-hmm. a trade off. But I'm I'm hearing you say that that <laughs> that stuff matters. Yeah, yeah, and I I think it's really important to know, you know, when you're really small and you're doing most of the, you know most of the work yourself, it's really hard to manage that kind of stuff. Um, what we've found even through, so our, our, our B Corp, uh, again at Ecolips, like our, our B Corp status, um, and we go through a pretty rigorous assessment, uh, it takes us a lot of people in a lot of time, about six months to do the assessment every two years. And they, uh, and what, what, what we really like about it is it's given us this uh infrastructure and this foundation to grow from and it's another set of eyes so now we have you know we get i mean we get we get inspected probably once a month or every two months whether it's whether it's fda or the usda organic or rabbis coming in for kosher right right that kind of stuff and then so um it keeps us all on the up and up and now i think there are some there are some third-party verifications that are half-assed and they aren't as as real as they should be mm-hmm. and those we don't use those mm-hmm. um, but having that extra set of eyes and that criteria that can be checked and double checked um, making sure that we're doing the right thing and our customers can be uh, assured that we are um, I think yeah it, it's it's paid for itself yeah that that's that's pretty cool so yeah. uh, there's certifications, but you were also talking about there's a giving back component. That's kind of a separate, mm-hmm. you know, we run a business, but we care. And so part of our profits go to help this and that. Uh, mm-hmm. Talk about how to find those, how to make them meaningful. And and here's a question for you. I, I used to be involved uh, with a big international company and, you know, digging wells and, mm-hmm. you know, $40,000 can, can feed a village. And my question was always, how should should we stop marketing that once we've spent 40,000 on marketing is it okay to, mm. to spend 40,000 to dig wells but what if we spend 2 million to market that message isn't that lopsided right. Right. you know so the, all these kind of considerations come into this good thing that helps business but mm-hmm. at, you know how do you how do you carve out the parameters of these good things yeah well another thing that we like about the b corp um is that we get we get scored on on that like that kind of ratio stuff you know it's like if you're if you're doing ten thousand dollars in good in good and you're you know uh you're spending a million dollars to market it that's not that's just not right and so and that's built into the b corp yep, thing that yep, that's great right so um i think you know it's like it's like a you know a nonprofit. um and this is the tricky part about private businesses. Though you really have to understand, you know, who's try to understand who's being truthful and who's not. But it's like the nonprofits that where you know the execs are getting millions and you know millions and bonuses and or or salary and you know the the net impact of their cause is is lessened because of these high salaries. Um, I think ultimately we just. Uh, I don't, I don't have a great answer for that question either, man. I think you just got to, you know, do as good as you can, yeah. um, give, give as much as you can, um, and market it as well as you can. And if you're in a position where you're, you can spend a, a you know, a hundred thousand dollars to market a 10,000, then you, you probably got the wrong, you got the, you got it going the wrong way. You know? Yeah. yeah. So, I, I've, I've seen you be uh, pretty nimble on these opportunities. It's one thing to think through what's my supply chain, what's something good we can do, give back to the mm-hmm. source. That That's great. Not knocking that. That's a great mm-hmm. way a lot of businesses can do it. But I've seen you respond to like local, natural disaster. How can we help? I'm not going to sleep. How do we, what's needed right now? Talk yep. about how yep. being nimble is Absolutely. a pretty good way to go about it. Right. right. So, and I, again, I, I, I love taking a, the for-profit business model and just doing as much good with it as possible. So, for instance, when the derecho hit or when the flood was here, but we'll use the derecho as an example, I immediately sprung into action. You know what? Here's a better example. Uh, let's uh, let's go back to when COVID started and there was a hand sanitizer shortage. Um, immediately, no questions asked, uh, leveraged, you know, so so here we are, Feb- March, April, 
April of last year. Nobody can get hand sanitizers. Our hospitals are running low on it. Uh, the police, the ambulance services, um, there's there's no sanitizer anywhere. And the, we're at the, the, lead, the leading phase of the epidemic. And, and, and what did you know about making hand sanitizer in that moment? Uh, not much. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it was 70% uh, al- ethyl alcohol, yeah. but here's what I knew. I knew that uh, that we have chemists at Ecolips, and I know a guy that has a lot of alcohol at Cedar Ridge. Yeah. And I'm like, we got to, look, let's try to, let's try to figure this out. One call to him. We're meeting two hours later. The next day, we're literally, ma- like, literally the next day, we're making hand sanitizer batches. That's crazy. Now, yeah, and we used Cedar Ridge um, to, and in, in, in within weeks, well, within a week, we're handing out thousands of free bottles to people, and, and at at my expense, at Ecolips expense, at a little bit of Soco expense, <laughs> you know, I was just like, what what can we all kind of afford? Who in, had to green light that at Ecolips? Yeah, I didn't ask anybody. Um, and, and, and I, very rare time where, um, you know, normally I run the place super democratically. Like I, I get approval for yeah. every purchase I make and everything. And, um, and, and we've got a great team of people that, that challenge stuff the right way, you know, okay. now, uh, with that, I'm like, we're, it, it was, it was, a. a in my opinion, um, an emergency life-threatening situation. And we have, we have what people need or we have the knowledge to do that. So I just went in, I think I, I directly sent an email and just said, Hey, I'm going to borrow these people for this amount of time. I mean, you know, I don't know what it's going to cost, but we got to do it. No questions asked. So, and it happened and it did, we gave away, you know, tens of thousands of little bottles of the community. We had, we did a drive through line before it was interesting before Everybody had figured out this this no touch drive through stuff. We set it up down at Newbo City Market, and and people drove in and we gave them, you know, we gave them a bottle or two, and then we started supplying the city of you know we we supplied the city of Cedar Rapids, the hospitals, the sheriff's department, post offices, and we were then now having trucks come up from other states, and um, we sold tens of thousands of gallons of initially our whole goal was just give it away. And then it was like, we, we had a, we had a rhythm down and it's like, finally um, Cedar Ridge ended up selling a lot of hand sanitizer to a lot of people and, and ultimately say, keeping a lot of people healthy. And and you didn't do it for the marketing, whatever, no. but no. the news yeah. was covering you guys. Facebook was going crazy. Everyone was Boom. like, look at these local businesses doing this cool thing, filling this need. Is there, is there a limit to how much I can use this <laughs> hammer? Because <laughs> <laughs> because it, it comes back <laughs> so right dropping the hammer once more so the this is that's the magic part of it that's where it's like man you know earning media uh is not easy but it's especially hard if you're not doing anything interesting and so uh you you know that's a great example of just like yeah if you do good things um, that are relevant to people and, uh, you're going to get coverage and that coverage is, is marketing and that marketing, uh, is worth, worth real money. And so our, our entire existence, we never had, our marketing budget has been really, really small at Ecolypse, all of them. And it's like, let's do stuff that gets people talking and is moderately newsworthy. Sometimes that those things happen organically. Like, like the, I mean, I, I, if we hadn't got any coverage about the hand sanitizer, we've been totally fine. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we were we made you know different national news uh, segments and rock and roll. That's crazy. Yeah. So people in marketing understand. Uh, I'll unpack it a bit. So there's paid media and then there's earned media. And so uh, if you're a pretty big company, you can be uh, a client of a, a company called Burrell's Loose, right? And they track. They have all these crazy computers and bots and feelers and and anything that happens in the media from the Today Show to a local TV news station in in you know. Butte, Montana or something, they track all of that and they have a way to compute what it would cost to pay for that kind of media and exposure and time in that market and all these different metrics. So um, the story you just told could be computed by a company called Brills Loose. I think it's like $40,000 a year to get that kind of media tracking. But they, if, if you're a client, they will show you like, okay, 
that hand sanitizer thing, Steve, you just earned right $4 million of, right. of earned media, and here's the proof. And so that's the kind of you know metric yeah. you can take to a board, to investors, or whatever, and say it paid for itself. Right. And that's like the, it's the power also of you know sampling your product out there, because guess what? It might end up in the, the hands of some influencer using the product that... So, you know, and, and that's the part that you just need to, you know, it's like, the, you know, it's like you can't win if you don't play. If, we do, if you're not doing things all the time, you know, nobody's, it's not going to make an impact. And you can't expect, it's just like if you're going to, if you're going to have an ad campaign, you don't just take out one ad one time. It's a campaign. And so having it as part of your ethos absolutely pays off. Another thing I, I did, just thought of was that the, the power of the impact of a business that has a social or environmental mission or that does good, the, the, um, it gives employees who work there a sense of fulfillment as well. That's huge. It's not just about the owners. So then yeah. all of a sudden you have this ripple effect into the culture of the business where it's like, I'm just, I'm not going just punching a clock and, you know, doing a few things here, you know, or, you know, making balm or whatever it might be. I'm going here because I'm part of a movement. I'm part of this machine that is doing good and creating a better world. And there, we, uh, we have so little turnover, like people don't quit, you know, at Ecolips. They just, they, because uh, they're, they're happy. They're fulfilled. That, that's, like, <laughs> that's great. Yeah, I mean, to, to borrow a, a phrase from The Bachelor, you guys are doing it for the right reasons. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 yeah. like, it's rewarding. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 So, so it, it, yeah, you can't go wrong doing right. Dude, that's good. Write that down. <laughs> yeah. <God. laughs> that is so yeah. good. Yeah, you can't go wrong doing right. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, what, are your, what are your thoughts about, um, you see big companies uh copying mimicking what's the right word Mo not mocking but um you you know small nimble companies mm -hmm. uh, can do and some big companies do too but you know small companies can be really nimble the story you mm -hmm. just told about uh the hand sanitizer i mean that's crazy cool and you did it for the right reasons it paid for itself and then some but um what are your thoughts when you see big corporations kind of try to you know they've got the money like huge budgets and maybe they're paying 20 million to advertise you know a one hundred thousand dollar good deed right but mm -hmm. what are your thoughts on this formula that you just mapped out for the right reasons and it pays for itself but you do see companies big companies mm -hmm. try to do this and kind of cash in on on that thing uh what, what are your thoughts on that I, I think the consumers uh are smarter than that you know i mean you know, you look at uh, Tom's shoes and, and they're so no matter what. So, you know, buy one, give one like yeah. that whole concept. There aren't any, uh, you know, multinational uh, companies that I know of that are doing something that aggressive. Yeah. So consumers are clued in to the companies that are doing the real good. Um, we have learned to not trust companies and especially uh -huh. big corporations. And so um, I, I guess I just think that people see through a lot of that, a lot of that stuff. And, and this is the other piece of it though, is that when we started, you know, back in 2003, uh, again, like their, their organic wasn't big, sustainability wasn't a word um, and uh, that anybody was really talking about. And there, it was really truly only authentic companies that were that were doing it and the bigger companies caught on to that and they actually saw us all grabbing market share mm -hmm. and so um chapstick uh came out with a natural lip balm um they copied our lip scrub product like note for note you know what and, a compliment right it's yeah yeah and we had so when, when you know blistex you know copied us on a couple things and it's like um and, and all of it is steering towards now, not necessarily the giving side of things, but I think they're, they're watching it going, oh, wow, these people that are really, you know, these, these authentic uh, innovators in this category um, are grabbing market share. And once it starts pulling dollars from them, then they listen. Mm -hmm. So if that's what it takes, great, whatever, you know, like mm -hmm. let's let it happen. 
and let's continue challenging, challenging them to do better. So, so if we respond as consumers to companies that are doing good things, um, and, and, and even if it is, if the, the really big guys start doing great things and really driving positive change, then let's support them. Uh, and, and so we can just do more of it. If you're really in it for the movement, you want the movement to it, right. it good across the world. Even if big corporations do some of these things, it, it helps the movement, right? Yeah. And, and I think it, it, the other cool thing about, you know, the state of, um, you know, a lot of industries right now is that, I mean, we, we are, everybody's open to change, uh, because we've mm -hmm. had a lot of changes in our world and, and, uh, and I think it's, it's, it's important to continually challenge the, the status quo and, and to let people into a meeting that might make things a little bit more, a little bit less comfortable, but might create a better outcome. So, um, I, I hope that right people on. are going, you know, that people are going into board meetings and pitching, you know, somewhat radical business, you know, uh, dynamics or, you know, business, uh, strategy that is more about total stakeholder involved involvement and engagement rather than just shareholders. I think the days of, of taking care of the shareholders, um, is in that, in that being the only thing that you think about is, is those are the old days and, uh, we can take care of the, the share, the shareholders can be a stakeholder, but we have all these other things to, to, uh, take care of as well. That's pretty cool. And it brings me back to a question I asked about, like, what if you're making widgets and how, you know, some products are just like, mm -hmm. how can anybody care that much? I, I need tires or whatever. But um, right. I, I think anybody listening to this conversation, uh, you know, would be inspired by this concept of it, it's not just a, a, a cool thing to give back and call it done. It, it really is about finding that movement or just being a good company yeah. that you want to be proud of and yeah. you want people to work for forever. This is where the rubber meets the road to positive change. I see what you did there. <laughs> My new tire company. <laughs> I mean, uh, <laughs> sorry. if it's too soon to talk about it, we don't have to, but you're involved in a, an electrical related kind of category. Yeah, yeah. Like maybe that's a good example. Like how do you find a good positive change thing uh, involved in, in a company like that? These guys hit me up, this local inventor, and they have this amazing, amazing product that is, is patented. It's a, it's a locking, uh, a locking outlet, basically. Um, nobody's ever done anything like it before. Um, what, and, and when they came to me, I was like, no, no, no. Like, no, I do coffee. I do lip balm. I'll, I'll help a startup here and there, but no. And, uh, they, uh, and it's, so they were persistent and we, they finally locked me down and, you know, locked, locked the time in and, and I saw the product and I'm like, oh my God, this is a game changer. And, and for me to, to get, I'm like, what can I do to help? And, uh, we, um, for me to get behind that, I had to really understand the product, but it's, look, I started looking at the data and how many people get electrocuted, how many fires start, how many children die every year from outlets that are just janky. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, this is, uh, this could save lives and it could save. And actually I started thinking about it. It could save money. And so we're looking at sustainability. Like if, if my refrigerator, if I'm sweeping behind my refrigerator and, and I, and the cord comes out of the wall and all that stuff goes to waste, you know, mm -hmm. whether it's at my restaurant or at my home, um, there's a sustainability piece that I found in it. There's a safety piece that I found in it. And there's, there's, there's money. Like, I mean, you know, hopefully, you know, profits. And, and I think within the electrical industry too, I'm like, you know, this, I told them too, I'm like, we gotta, you know, we gotta carve out some, some money to, to, you know, we gotta give it away and, and continue to try to be, you know, be the good steward in business. On this podcast, uh, you had a great idea about trying oh. to uh, be responsive and get some uh, listener viewer feedback involved. Yeah, yeah. So uh, threw it out on my Facebook page. Um, you know, uh, what are some questions that you have for, uh, for me or topics that you would like to have discussed? And uh, we'll do more of this and definitely hit me up. So it's, I'm at Steve Shriver, um, at Steve Shriver on Twitter, um, at Steve Shriver on Facebook. Um, and I guess that same on Instagram. But if so, message me or hit us up on any questions that you have that want to get covered right now. I think we do have some. Are you going to you going to find them or am I going to find oh, them? Oh, if you've got it up there. Yeah, okay. something. Okay. So we had quite a few on this last post I sent out there. 
Some really good stuff. People jumped on that. You basically said, hey, I'm starting a podcast. Do you have any topics or little things I should be discussing? And it lit up. It did. And it shows me that, like, I mean, that, well, for one, you know, learn, we, you know, we, we're all here to continually learn, hopefully. And, um, and it really told me that there's a need for what we're doing here. Uh, yeah. And so, so some of these topics are, they need to go in the hat. They're entire right. episodes. They're great. Yep. Um, but are, so are you scanning for a little nugget mm-hmm. you can kind of, we can talk about right now? That's what I'm doing. That's what I'm doing. So, uh, yeah, I, th- I'll, I'll just grab this. So like, uh, AJ Venn said, um, like when, uh, when, si- when a side hustle becomes something more than a side hustle, I think that's great because I, I truly believe that everybody should have a side hustle of some sort, you know, and especially if you're, if you are in an entrepreneurial mindset, um, because you can continually learn just like I did, um, about these different industries and different experiences. So the, the, the real trick though, is if you have a sweet day job and you have a small side hustle, like taking the leap of faith into the entrepreneurial world and, you know, making that your full-time gig. Um, that is a question that, you know, is not easy to answer. Um, but I would just say, you know, you, in a perfect world, make 50, 75% of the income and have your trajectory heading in the direction of full, you know, of, of success in your business, um, to the point where you feel good and confident enough to leave your, your day gig. Um, but, or can you, can you operate them both at the same time until you're 100% certain that you, that you can take that leap? And I think, uh, you, you, yeah, you just gotta, you're going to have to work hard. I mean, this is we're you know, I work seven days a week. I work at night. I work in the morning. And all day long, I have a lot of fun too, but I'm just saying like, you know, we, we are all capable of more than we're doing and, and, and so many levels. And so, you know, uh, if you're trying to squeeze your side hustle and your day job into a nine to five or nine to six, then you're probably not going to ever get out of that, that rut or not rut <laughs> that rhythm. But, uh, you know, just got to work your butt off, prove it out. I, I'm I'm hearing you answer that in two parts. It's a personality passion question, but it's mm-hmm. also there's a math to it when you're ready and mm-hmm. profit. Uh, and you're you're addressing both. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean you gotta. I mean yeah, because you gotta be smart about it. I mean, but the other thing is like if you it, it's it comes what your what your threshold is of of risk and uh, and and stress, you know. And it's like if you need if you if you get to a point where you're like, you know what, I'm going to take that leap and it feels like the right time. I don't care where you're at. Sometimes people need that hunger to drive them to, you know, to, to full sustainable business. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's different in every one of us, but yeah, I like that fire. I like having like, Oh crap. I don't know how I'm going to, you know, pay the bills on this thing for the next three months, but I'm going to figure it out. That scares some people. Yeah. Most people. Whatever, man. Not you. No, <laughs> <laughs> no it's, it's true. It, it should scare you. But it also, you can use that as, as fuel. It sounds like yeah. it excites you. Yeah, man. I love the chase. <laughs> oh. Give me something to chase down. I'm That's doing great. it. Yeah. That's great. Let me see if there's one one more quick one here. Um, mm, great. Da, da, da. You know, I, this is something that I'm not, somebody asked about personal brand development and that's not something that I'm, I'm considered myself great at. It's probably not ever, maybe if we have it, have it as a topic on the show in the future, probably bring in a guest or something like that. Mm. But I can say that, um, I do, I do probably do a better job at it than a lot of people. And it's because I'm, I'm out in the public. I'm trying to, I'm, I'm, trying to do relevant things. Um, I'm definitely, you know, uh, I, I believe in networking. I believe in, 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 uh, meeting as many people as possible. Um, and just really trying, you know, to, uh, to c- connect with people. And so I connect with people personally, like I hope my brands connect with people. And that is, you know, that's like part of my my mission is like, I want, I want the Steve Shriver brand to, 
to be a positive experience and a positive, you know, have a little bit of mind share so that when, I mean, honestly, self-serving uh, to a, to a degree, because when I, when I say there's like a sale at SoCo or Bohemia, or we're having an event at the Olympic, um, you know, people listen and I've earned that. It takes mm. years and years mm-hmm. and, you know, good branding doesn't happen overnight. Mm-hmm. So you gotta, you gotta work hard for that. How do you say no? Uh, people oh. hit you up all the time, right? Yeah, that, you know, I'm not good at that. Uh, not, I'm not good at that. So I think I should probably work on that. Um, <laughs> but uh, I think by, so I, I'll go through phases though, where I'll be like, I'm not taking any speaking engagements or I can't do any more meetings or any call, you know, and I'll, I'll stretch yeah. it out and kind of leave big open spaces for myself. But um, I'm, I'm, I'm a yes person. And, and, and part of that, I think has fueled the success and also this neurotic idea that I can, you know, run five businesses at the same time. But, (laughs) but because I, if I had, if I had said no to meeting with the guys that wanted to open the outdoor store with me, you know, I wouldn't have that. If I'd said no to, and there's little things and big things all day long. If If I'd said no to the, the meeting at the EDC entrepreneurial development center, where I was going to meet Jeff from Cedar Ridge, I wouldn't have been able to, I wouldn't have known him well enough to call him about the hand sanitizer thing. So, yeah. 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 You know, when you, when you talk about that, it, it makes me think about how, uh, you know, we're friends. So I, I, I know more about you than, than most people, but um, you, you sound fairly invincible when you talk about that, but I know you get stressed. Oh God. We, we share a yeah. skin peel condition <laughs> yeah. thing. Uh, I know you lose oh, sleep. a lot, dude. <laughs> I don't have any skin peel conditions. Do you, do you still have that? Remember, like, on <laughs> oh, yeah, dude, certain yeah. fingers. Thanks. Your skin, mine, mine does too. It, it yeah. peels okay. when, when we're stressed, right? Like, we, So we share that. I know you lose sleep. Yeah. I know. Uh, no, I've been in the hospital for, you know, yeah. like bedridden um, for stress related illnesses. Uh, and all of it was related to business. Yeah. And yeah. my, you know, and, and, and yeah, but. Something about that feels okay. Yeah. I mean. And, and it, it's, it's kind of, you know, and I only bring that up because you're talking about you have a hard time saying yeah. no. And you're, you're passionate about all these things and you have so much going on. And, you know, I just wanted listeners to know that as invincible oh, yeah. as, as you can sound, you're, you never hesitate. I've heard you talk about mental health things. Like you, you are a real person and, and you, you don't hesitate when it's brought up to talk about like, yeah, here, here's the yeah. stress side of, of this equation. So and Andrea would be the first to tell people, she's like, why don't, you know, I'll, I'll go do a speaking engagement somewhere and she'll say, and I never want to do the same thing twice. And so I'm like, what should I talk about this time? And she's like this, I just remember this one time. She's like, why don't you tell them the truth? Tell them that sometimes you walk in the door at night and lay on the floor and stare at the ceiling. Tell them the side, (laughs) the side of entrepreneurship that I'm, that she is the only one that knows how rough it is. Tell them how you had to sell your car to pay your taxes like just three years ago, even though we're like, you know, supposedly worth some money, you know, like, <laughs> uh, you know, so there's definitely those hardships and, uh, and those, that stress. Um, but it's equally, you know, um, I guess it's, it's, it's kind of like the, the, you know, the, the harder the climb, yeah. the more fulfilling it is. And yeah. like, yeah, yeah, I'm pushing it to the limits. I mean, if, if you were not taking steps that involved risk and you just stayed in a little square mm-hmm. of complete safety, um, that's, that's, that's not yeah. your jam. That's not what you do. Nope. That's yeah. Nope. That's, I mean, I want to, I'll tell you this. My goal was to have 10 businesses operating at the same time like that. And so I was like, all right, one, two, three, four, I got five. I might be working on a sixth one right now. But what I realized was that I was like, 10 might be a little too much. <laughs> yeah. yeah, let's uh, wrap it up. Um, man, this is fun. Thank you, everybody, for, uh, for joining us. It's the Steve Shriver Podcast. We have many more to come. And uh, we're going to, we have a lot of topics. We have a hat full of topics. And we'll also, uh, various times, we'll bring in guests. Um, but, uh, for right now we're going to, we're, we're riffing out of the hat. So thank you for taking the time, Joe. Thank you for doing what you do as always. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, rock on. 
The Steve Shriver Show is brought to you by Ecolips, the original organic lip balm. Use the promo code PODCAST20 for 20% off your first order on Ecolips.com. Keep up with the show at steveshriverpodcast.com and the Steve Shriver Podcast on Facebook.